G'day guys, welcome back to another episode of my SC24 Chelsea Career Mode series. We're back in the chair for another one and Burnley is the objective tonight and it is a must win game. So make sure you are subscribed and keeping an eye out for my instant match reaction because I will be watching the game live and then posting my thoughts on what I see and hopefully it is a positive experience because it is one of those games we just certainly cannot be dropping points to a relegation side that is Burnley. As you can see in the career mode here, those are the objectives, but it doesn't look like we're going to be getting close to any of them because we are still sitting in ninth spot on the table. And in this episode, we have going, it's going to be stacked full of games. As you can see, we've got Newcastle and Tottenham, as well as an FA Cup fixture up against Leeds to get past before we catch up to where we are in real life with Burnley at Stamford Bridge completing the month of March. Now, this is the team that I have settled on in the last couple of episodes. I think it's been working the most effective out of all the, all the formations I've tried so far with the Tiki Taka style of football. Our team is fully fit and sharpness is all as, as high as it can be. So let's continue into this game against Newcastle and hopefully pull off a positive result. We've got all games at home as well, so no excuse to be losing. And it's a case where Pochettino really has to galvanize this team and really sustain momentum to what is the running of the season because European football is a must. Losing the Carabao Cup final, as we discussed in the last episode, uh, means we miss out on the opportunity for the Conference League, which is a competition that probably most fans have little interest in or don't really care. Um, I was personally hoping that we did win the final, that way we could qualify for it because it's a competition that Chelsea have not won and we've won it all. So maybe it could have been another trophy that we could have added to the cabinet. But because we lost that game to Liverpool, uh, it means we've got to go either to get top seven football or we have to win in the FA Cup final, which is not going to be an easy task because we've got Manchester City up next at Wembley. And uh, I, I honestly can't see any possible possibility where we beat them. It's Pep Guardiola's side are just absolutely formidable. Yes, they've got a few injuries, and of course they've got a huge um, obstacle coming up against Arsenal at the weekend, which will potentially decide the Premier League title as Isaac goes in on goal, forces a challenge out of Vafana. It's mistimed, gets himself a yellow, and a dot shot is coming up for Newcastle here. A terrible start to the game. Not ideal. The main man from Newcastle is going to step up and bury it into the middle right of the net. And he celebrates in front of the away, the away support. It's still early. Lots can change. But hopefully we can get a quick response because that is what we need. And I think... With our team that we've got so far, we've got so much electrifying pace up front that we've really got to make use of it. And we have not even like a... Oh! Gliding through like he's on ice skates. But he's not one of those players that's slipping and sliding and making a fool of himself. He's sliding through like he's an Olympic skater. Beautiful. Unable to bury it. Can we get someone on it here? We can't. Connor has to win the header. Doesn't, which is terrible. And Mudrick gets dispossessed. And another opportunity for the Blues. Passes us by. Oh, Reese James, you're elite. Noni has to score now. Yes! Come on! Christopher Nkunku is there when, he, when he's needed most. Noni Mudweke again making a mistake when he's getting to the... Decisive moment, not finishing and putting it in the back of the net. Thankfully, the deflection from the goalkeeper falls favorably to our main man up top. He's not exactly the tallest player on the pitch, but his jump was to his advantage and he gets the ball in the back of the net. Thank bloody God for that because Newcastle are one of those teams that we that's sort of competing against us for that you know top six to top ten spot in the Premier League. And uh, we do not want to be a mid-table club. We want to be getting as close to the bottom end, bottom end of the top six as Sanchez pulls off a very important save. Oh, what a turn by Noni. 
James is making another good run in behind. He hasn't exactly got the pace to get past him, but he's got the composure and the dribbling. Enzo! Oh, I can't find anyone in the center there. Can Mudra get in? Surely! Oh, Trippier somehow outpaces Misha there. Oh, got it back. Oh, surely. Nonny, third time, is the charm! Get in! Nonny Madweke scores the second to put us in the lead at Stamford Bridge right before half time. Excellent goal, getting the ball back, pushing up high, and forcing the mistake and capitalizing when it matters most. Beautiful bloody goal there. And Enzo gets the decisive clearance. That concludes the first half. Let's get straight into the second and hopefully continue this positive form. Oh, Sanchez having to pull off a big save there. Cucurella not able to catch his man. He was running away like a criminal from the police. And Newcastle do look like a bunch of criminals with their outfit on. Oh! Oh, come on! Oh, I can't believe that. That was so close. Bloody hell. Hopefully that's not a missed chance that's going to come back to bite us on the bum later. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh! Trouble. Enzo Fernandez. More Drake. Continues his run. And Kunku. And Kunku, come on. Yes! What a goal! What an absolutely sublime finish. This guy is class, man. This is the type of finishing that we've been sorely lacking from the Chelsea Football Club this season. Honestly, there was moments within that phase of play where I thought I might have overcooked it. But look at here, just the acceleration to get away from the defender, the slide back on his right foot, the little dribble, and then the whew, finish on his left foot just to glide it into that bottom corner. And the Newcastle goalkeeper should have done better, but he didn't. And the number 18 is the one that gets the nail in the coffin for Newcastle United. Our next obstacle in the career mode is an FA Cup tie against Leeds. Now, I've seen this conversation happen in the Chelsea community as we begin the simulation. Is what is Chelsea's current best starting eleven? And that is something I've seen uh, George Benson um, talk on his YouTube channel about with uh, the Joey Knight podcast and whatnot. And I want to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. What do you think is our current strongest starting 11? And what you see on, on screen here is my personal opinion of what is our best team. I think Petrovic, since he's come in, has looked super solid. Far more composed on the ball and definitely more reliable at the back than when I've seen Sanchez in goal. I've never understood the signing of him and uh, making him the number one. I think he was meant to be the number two competing with Kepa, but then Kepa fucked off to Real Madrid, rightfully so. And hopefully he doesn't come back and hopefully we can get a bit of coin from him. But I think Petrovic could be potentially our new number one going forward. But the problem is, is he's still young. He's still got a lot to learn. Is it an area that the ownership will strengthen in in the upcoming transfer windows? I don't think so. I think there's other areas on the pitch that require our attention first as Christopher Nkunku gets the first goal. Then we transition to our defense. And I think the formation that we're most likely going to go with under Pochettino moving forward is the 4-2-3-1 with Enzo and Casado in the pivot with Lavia potentially featuring as well as Nkunku gets a double in the first half. Reese James is obviously still recovering from his injury. The injury crisis is a whole separate conversation. 
But I think he, when he is fully fit and on his day, is the best right back in the world. Defensively, super solid. But also, when he goes forward, when he's making those overlapping runs, delivering balls with his right foot into the box, or even shooting himself, I just think there's no one better in the game. Maybe you could argue Trent Alexander-Arnold has a better passing ability, but defensively, he's not as good as James. So I think when he's fully fit, he's got to come straight back into the team on that right back position, which pains me to see, say, because Milo Gusto has been absolutely exceptional for the 20-year-old that he is so far this season. Which then brings me to the conversation of, he's been so good, Is he? does he deserve to be dropped when James becomes fit again next season? Some of you may say yes, some of you may say no, because your solution might be to put him as the left-back, because the left-back position has been something that we have not exactly found um, as much solidity in, so far this season with Cucurella being out injured, Chilwell being inconsistent, and then um, Ian Matson being shipped off to Dortmund on loan. So I personally think when Ben Chilwell gets his fitness and sharpness back, as Leeds get a goal back here, and I'm going to make some quick substitutions so that we do finish this game strongly because um, I don't want to be um, finishing it off really tired. And then uh, let's bring on Connor Gallagher into that cam position. And I think the rest will be fine. So I think when we have Chilwell back to fully fit and sharpness, I think they're going to be our two fullbacks for the remainder um, of, well, for the foreseeable future, that's for sure. Wesley Fofana is also another one that we're still waiting to see how his re rehabilitation goes. Can he recover and then come back into the squad and be that player that we know he can be? Hopefully the answer is yes, as Leeds get a late equaliser, which is not good. That means we're going to potentially play a replay fixture. But I think Fafana, if he is able to fully recover, will be the next best option besides Levi Colwell, who is going to definitely be our centre-back for the future. Casado and Enzo Fernandez, I think it's pretty obvious that they're going to be the midfield pivot moving forward, all the money we spent on them. Um, obviously, Mudrik... And um, Medweke on the left and the right. But I think Palmer probably gets that... Um, oh, there's extra time. Sorry, I just was slightly distracted then. So it is extra time. All right, we're going to definitely have to watch um, the fitness levels here. I think we might have to... Um, what am I going to do here? I think I might take Jackson off, put Sterling up top, and then bring on Carney Chukameka, who I believe can still play on that left wing, even though he is very unhappy. Hopefully that doesn't cost us. And then I might actually take Chilwell off and bring Cucurella on as well. So when those substitutions come on, hopefully they can get the job done as Nicholas Jackson, before he comes off, is the one that puts us in the lead. Let's use this opportunity to talk about Jackson now. Because whilst I think he's still a, a solid option for us, I, I do believe, and I've been saying this Pretty much the whole season, Chelsea are one elite striker away from being a really world-class football team again. Even though we've got so much you know, young, inexperienced players at our, at our disposal, I think we've got a good enough squad to be competing for top four football. And Pochettino has said that based off the data and the analytics and you know how we have performed, that we should be in top four in the Premier League. Obviously, results have not been like that because we've been making too many mistakes. But we definitely should be doing better. And I think if we can get someone like a Victor Osherman and put him up top and give him good service, he might be the solution to our lack of goal scoring that we've had so far this season. Plus, Nicholas Jackson, he's been playing on the left a little bit recently. And he's been doing actually pretty good. So he could be a potential... Uh, he could potentially play in that position out wide, which then still offers us um, a level of height to set pieces, um, both offensively and defensively. And um, as we get the result here against um, Leeds, not exactly the best performance from our team, but Jackson and Nkunku doing most of the heavy lifting and securing this result. So the last little bit I'll add is um, Mikhailo Mudrik. Could he also be playing in a number 10 position, which I've seen some people discuss online because he's, you know, Pochettino's tinkered with that recently. You've got to figure out a way to get Mudrik into the side. I still think on the left with his pace is probably the best way to go because Nkunku definitely has to be playing in behind the striker. But 
potentially Nkunku plays up top if we don't go in for a striker because we don't have the funds and the financial fair play of it all. And then maybe Mudrik plays centrally. That could also be a possibility. Again, let me know your thoughts down below. What do you think is Chelsea's best starting 11? Transitioning very swiftly into the game against Tottenham. This game hasn't been played in real life, but of course in the schedule, this is where it would fall. And before I get to it, I want to just quickly mention Cole Palmer because obviously in the career mode, he's only rated 70 and he's just, he's just not good enough for this career mode in terms of what I need to be getting out of these players in order to be accomplishing something on the field. So I think he definitely would slot into that right wing or even potentially cam position within our best starting 11. Um, but unfortunately, he can't do that in the career mode. I think the team that I've got currently is, uh, right there is the best um, possible team I can put out um, in this career mode. And then Raheem Sterling, he's a subject for lots of debate within the uh, Chelsea community right now. For those who've been following this series and have definitely been watching my instant match reactions, you know my thoughts on Sterling. I think he's past it. I don't think he's good enough. It just definitely doesn't seem like he cares at least with his you know displays on the field and i think he needs to be shipped off come this next transfer window speaking of players that we're going to sell obviously financial fair play is something that lots of teams in the premier league have been worrying about because it does seem to be a rule set that has a bit of teeth now and uh chelsea obviously being uh spending a billion pounds worth of transfers in the last two seasons since Clear Lake Capital took over the club. Um, puts us in a tricky position in terms of our finances. Um, not accomplishing a uh, level of European football has meant our um, revenue has been severely limited, um, as well as all the off-field uh, sponsorship deals that have had to be revamped um, behind the scenes. Um, obviously, we had that massive player clear-out, which did obviously bring us a decent amount of money, which... Um, put us in good stead, but it's obviously not going to be enough if we don't get European football again this season um, and we don't win a trophy. So hopefully we can uh, accomplish those objectives, which allows us to go again in the next transfer window and hopefully strengthen that striker position. Um, again, potentially even maybe a centre-back to replace Thiago Silva if he moves on. Um, but the problem is, is if we don't accomplish our objectives, it may mean we might have to sell some players um, from our youth academy because it will be straight profit on the books to basically give us um, pro money straight into the account that is not um, on the balance sheet uh, as an expense. Because obviously when you buy a player, they depreciate um, over their contract. So... If you get a player that comes straight through from the academy, like you know Conor Gallagher, which is the big headline that everyone has been talking about, or even other players like Ian Matson or Lewis Hall or Armando Breuer, who are out on loan, those players, if we do sell them, will be straight profit, and that will be really advantageous for us in terms of our um, financial fair play um, situation. Whereas players like Lukaku or Ziyech or even Raheem Sterling, if we were to sell, those players... Um, we won't exactly be making um, profit on because um, when we bought them, Lukaku, for example, I thought we bought for 100 million euros or something like that. Um, you know, he's already two years into his contracts, so he's probably worth around 50 million euros, if that. He's probably less because he hasn't exactly been lighting up the um, Serie A. And um, Tottenham seem to be continuing putting on the pressure here, but my point is... Conor Gallagher, do we sell him in the next transfer window? No. Is he a player that is going to be easily slotting into our best team? No. Yes, he's been playing really well. Uh, almost tits that up. Has he been performing really well this season? Yes. Is he a player for the future? Yes. Does he make it into the best starting 11? No. Reason being, I just don't know where he fits. Is he the best CDM in the team? No. Casado gets that position. Lavia probably still even gets it over... Um, Gallagher when he becomes fit again. Um, is he a better box-to-box -box midfielder than Enzo Fernandez? In terms of energy and the engine room, potentially. But is he technically better? Absolutely not. We're not going to replace Gallagher for Enzo. Um, and then in the attacking midfield position, is he going to play there? Personally, I don't want to see him there. Has he added goals to his game this season? Yes. Has he proved me wrong on many occasions? Yes. Is he still the best option for that camp position moving forward? 
Personally, I don't think so. Some people may disagree with me, and if you did, I would totally respect that. But me, I just can't see Conor Gallagher being the one to be getting those essential assists and goals consistently throughout an entire Premier League season. Is he great with that box-to-box -box and adding that energy, similar to how Mason Mount performed under Frank Lampard? Is he one of those players that has shown leadership and, and is a player that Pochettino likes? Yes. And those are the reasons why I think we need to keep him as a squad player. Because he knows the club, he's been around for so long, he loves it, he loves playing for the badge. And I just think if we did sell him, it would be a travesty um, and a huge failing of the new ownership at the Chelsea Football Club. And I'm very glad that we have got the decisive goal to put us in the lead here against Spurs. Moving on into the second half, leading by a goal to nil. It's not exactly a secure lead. Tottenham, I would say, have definitely been the better side this game, controlling possession and um, the chances as we get another good tackle there, but Noni not able to find the pass inside. And um, Christopher Nkunku has been leading the line very well, but I just don't think he has the, uh, the size and the strength the physical strength to uh, be the player that Chelsea um, are going to require to get you know twenty odd goals a season uh, to um, get us into anywhere competitive in the Premier League, which is why I think he needs to sit either alongside or behind um, that type of striker. Nicholas Jackson, I really did think was going to be that, um, especially from what I saw in preseason, and he's shown glimpses of it, glimpses of it. Um, throughout this season, but just too inconsistent, unfortunately. Oh, son. Oh, he's just ease past Fafana there. Not good enough by that defender. Now we have a corner to defend. Oh, good tackle there by Gallagher. Has he got the pace to get away? He has. Would have preferred if Mudrick was there. Oh, gets a great little back heel pass. Oh, and Kunku stopped his run. Potentially ran, running out of gas. Now we have to reset, slow the tempo. Do a little again. Oh, what a turn. Oh, and Conor Gallagher rifles a shot from the barrel. Has it. Oh, good interception there by Gallagher. Ah, oh, he's not tricky enough to get past the defence there. Our press so far has been working. Tottenham have not been able to escape this area of the field. Oh, they might be able to unlock it here. The pass is good. It's not. We've got it back. The clock continues to tick down and we haven't got our substitutes on, which means we've got tired bodies all over the field, which means we probably need to be a little bit smart on how we play here. But Cucurella gets the cross in. Not able to find someone. Mudrik isn't able to get the ball either. Oh, and Conor Gallagher makes a mistake. Can our defenders get back in time? Reese James. Can he land the tackle? He can't. Hoiberg. A man in this position that doesn't exactly land a much of a threat. And thankfully to Sassy. Oh, no. Oh, what a save. And Kunkarella just keeps it in. If we are somehow able to secure this win when I... Scheduled substitutions for the 65th minute. And they have not come on, which means our team is very, very tired. If we can somehow survive this onslaught from Tottenham, it will be some remarkable victory. Desassi, can he clear it out? Surely, referee, full time whistle goes, and we have got the three points at Stamford Bridge yet again. Wow. Have to give credit to the boys there. Our shape, our pressing, and that very important goal that we got. Absolutely amazing stuff from the Blues here.
with only two days to recover for this game against Burnley. I've put the fitness levels up as much as I can. I've made some slight changes to the team. Burnley in their yellow away kit go up against Chelsea Blues in the rain at Stamford Bridge. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. This is the main event of this video. Hopefully, it is an absolutely cruisy win because we need to be getting a very comfortable win, I think, because Chelsea against Burnley, we have such a better team. Yes, Vincent Company likes to play some, some expansive football, and uh, it can be easy on the eye, but they have struggled severely this season. The move up from the championship has just been a step too big for them. And it has resulted in a relegation battle, which means Chelsea, of old, would probably be dispatching this team with ease. Hopefully, we can... Jackson with a bicycle kick goal! You can't make this stuff up! Absolutely amazing goal! That's the way to do it. Celebrate like Wayne Rooney. Nicholas Jackson, the man who comes into the team for this game, has come up with an absolute waldy. A Puskas contender here. What a goal by the number 15. The stuff of dreams. An absolutely legendary goal. One that will be remembered definitely by the end of this season. The Burnley defender and goalkeeper colliding. Neither could stop the ball from going in the back of the net. And Vincent Company, with his massive forehead absolutely is dismayed by what he's just seen. A fifth minute bicycle kick goal by Nicholas Jackson. Wowee. Oh, and Raheem Sterling with such ease pushes the ball into the back of the net and we are already two goals to the good within the first 10 minutes. Yes, guys, it's still on world class, but it's exactly as I predicted coming into it. Burnley, they're dog shit and they are getting absolutely given the service that they deserve. And Chelsea with Raheem Sterling, the number seven short hair in the game. Plays like a tennis ball in real life, but it doesn't matter here. He's got our second. Oh, the cut inside sent the defender to another postcode. The goalkeeper, the brick wall that he is, pushes it out for a corner. Reese James. With his deadly right foot. Can he whip it in to someone's head? No. Connor Gallagher? No. Oh, Madwake with a terrible first touch. James whipping it in. That is indeed an absolute rocket from Reese James. And a spaceship has taken off to another galaxy. Nicholas Jackson has come up with two, not one, but two incredible bicycle kick goals in this game. You, I honestly cannot believe it. The goalkeeper is utter trash. You might as well, might as well have picked him up from the Sunday League. He is absolutely awful. But it's 3-0 at Stamford Bridge. And two of them have come from Nicholas Jackson from another galaxy. Wow, 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 wow. Half-time whistle goes, and I think I've run out of superlatives and adjectives to describe those Nicholas Jackson goals. Truly outstanding. Man of the match performance so far. He's only played 45 minutes. All right, time to make some substitutions. Two players that don't get as many minutes in-game that I really wish they could, Palmer and Lavia. Hopefully they can impress. Well, Burnley just glided past our defence there. We were absolutely in sorts. I make the substitutions, and the players just seem to not be in the right shape. Players are getting dragged out, and Sanchez 
just does not make the right decision. As you can see, Fafana running into his partner in crime, DeSassi, there, which creates the gap in between him and Reese James. And the midfielder pushes forward, buries it, and now clean sheet, gone just like that. Wow, what a way to get a hat-trick. That is absolutely magic. Pure and utter magic from the Chelsea Blues there. Probably one or too many passes, um, but it doesn't matter. We're able to constantly pick out our targets. Archers in the midfield finds the number or our number nine, our main man up top. And Nicholas Jackson, who comes in for the tired and Kunku, has absolutely delivered. If he was a postman, I would be very happy because I've got all my parcels delivered on time. And I am super happy with this result. 4-1 to Burnley. If this is the type of result that we're getting in real life in just a couple hours time, I will be extremely happy. Happy. And I don't care if you're watching this game before or after the game in real life. If you're enjoying this video, please smash that like button because we might be in for a fifth. Oh, Sterling. Well, nothing for the players in the middle to work with. Oh, Sterling in. Can he get all the way? Oh, he can. And just like that, it's five. One, an absolute demolition job. The construction crew have come to Stamford Bridge and they have knocked down every single one of the Burnley defence. Raheem Sterling, pace, composure, precision on the weak foot. Goalkeeper should have done better. Doesn't matter. 5-1. And for the last remainder of this game, we've been passing the ball around. The Chelsea fans celebrate each pass as it unfolds. Jackson collects the match ball at the end of it. And that was a performance from a side that has shown such great potential. And in the past, we have not been able to capitalize, but this time we have against a much weaker opposition. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much if you've got to this stage of the video. I do appreciate it as always. And I will catch you in the next episode where it is the run-in for the Chelsea Football Club and towards the end of this season. We need to be getting as close as we can to top six football. It seems like a task that is going to be too much for Pochettino. But who knows, football is a crazy game. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Come on, you blues. You're welcome.